most importantly, happy Halloween. Um, I was trying to figure out what I dressed up as retroactively when I didn't dress up. I guess I'm just a boring teacher. That's what I am. Um, but check out my stickers. Ah, oh, they're so cute. All right. So uh, just picking up from Tuesday, uh, I kind of left you with a, with a task. What? You did? Yes, I did. But we'll pretend like I didn't. Uh, so we're talking about this, uh, this survey where we were talking about um, the northern ice cap may completely melt in the next hundred years. And then the survey question asked, would this bother you a great deal, some a little, or not at all, if it actually happened? And so the survey would look something like that. And then we had the survey responses. And we had already done an example of the voting results. Is that me? Okay. Like, I never have my ringer on, so... I don't know what could have happened there, but um, yeah, it wasn't me. So the results, so the general social survey, which we are going to use as kind of representing, representing all Americans, because it's a, a survey in the, in the US. So they asked the, the same question in the GSS, the General Social Survey, as it, I think it stands for. And we have the responses from the 2010 GSS, as well as from a group of introductory students at Duke University. So each of these got, uh, got the same survey. And we are going to be interested in the proportion who answered that they would, it would concern them a great deal. Okay. What are we gonna do? All of these are not a great deal. Right. And so in our case, because I'm interested in those who answered it would bother them a great deal, this is what we would call a success in this case. And not a great deal would be a failure. It doesn't matter how you failed in this scenario, right? Sometimes we might be interested in who answered some or a little or not at all. So depending on what it is you're interested in, that will determine what a success is. We have our total sample sizes for each of the groups. And we're going to let the U.S. represent or be represented by the GSS. And then Duke University students are represented by themselves. We've got a smaller sample of Duke University students. That's fine because we're going to be talking about the proportion of Duke University students versus the proportion of Americans, right, who say a great deal. Now we have this, uh, it does walk us through it. And I am going to leave that here. But I'm going to add a bunch of pages here. So the question that I want to answer as review is, is there a significant difference in the proportion of Americans who responded a great deal versus Duke University students who responded a great deal? So is there a difference? Oops, that doesn't look very nice. Is there a difference in the proportion of Americans versus Duke students? The author, Mina, works at Duke University, so she has a lot of Duke um, examples. Um, is there a difference in the proportion of Americans versus Duke students 
to answer a great deal. Oops. I'm cutting out a lot of words there, right? When asked the question, if the Northern ice caps were melting in the next hundred years, would this bother you a great deal? But uh, just kind of simplified it. Okay. So I'm gonna add a page here. Okay. So what we have is we have the US and we have Duke. Let's just grab what we need. If we let group one, let one be US and two be Duke, I like to do it in the order that they appear. And so I'm going to do it this way. I know in the slides, which I'll keep in there, but we won't go through. Uh, they have it in the opposite order, but you can see that it's the same. Okay. And so I'm going to let group one be the US and group two be Duke, which means that X1, the number of successes in group one is 454 and X2 is 69. N1 and N2 from here, I have 680 and 105. Because I'm comparing two groups, that tells me that this is a two sample proportion type of question, right? And so here, I want to compare, compare proportions from two groups, which means that it's two sample proportions Uh, type of question, which tells me what? It tells me where to look on my formula sheet, right? And then as we get more comfortable with our formula sheet, right, let that be your guide as to what to do next. So let's see here. I think I finally tamed my, my iPad, but I guess I shouldn't have said that. So it's on your second page of the formula sheet. And if you need a copy of the formula sheet, I have some up here. So this is what we went through last day in detail, right? We can build a confidence interval. We can do a hypothesis test, which is a little bit more elaborate uh, where we need the pooled proportion. Okay? But I tell you what the pooled proportion is. And so knowing just from the question that, okay, I wanna compare proportions from two groups, two sample proportions, then I have to be working here in the formula sheet. Okay. I'll give myself one more line because from these, right, the number of successes and the sample size, I can also find the sample proportions. I don't need to give you those in the question, right? Sometimes I just give you the successes and the sample sizes from each group, and then you have to solve for the proportions like we do in this case. P1 hat is 454 over 680. And I'll keep it on the same page here or on the same line. 454 over 680. I'm gonna go to four decimal places is usually safe. 0.6676 to four decimal places. 
because I'm going to use the, the decimal approximation, right? You don't want to round too quickly. Uh, ideally keep all the decimal places, but it's going to be pretty messy. So you don't have to. P2 hat is 69 over 105. 69 over 105 is 0. 0.6571 to four decimal places. So what are we really asking? The question is really asking, is there a significant difference between 0.6676 and 0.6571? There's no way for us to really know. We know that these are not the same. Right, but we need to take into account the spread of this distribution. Right? And that comes from here, from the sampling distribution, but that's already incorporated in our formulas. So we don't really need to worry about it, but we do need to remember that we need to take into account the spread to determine if these are significantly different from each other. Now, the question, is there a difference in the proportions and so it doesn't you know look that bad but if you want to establish if there's a difference or a significant difference then you have to do a full-blown hypothesis test yeah. so this here is there a difference that tells me i need to do a hypothesis test to be able to say yes there is a significant difference or no there is not a significant difference okay a hypothesis test we have to check the conditions oh can i be lazy so we check the conditions. They're so boring. Fine. The conditions for a hypothesis test for two sample proportions, they're the same as one sample proportion except for both samples with the added condition that, okay, now each of the samples have to be independent of each other as well. And so the conditions, um, oh, what do we need before we check the conditions? For a hypothesis test, I need the pooled proportion. Conditions need the pooled proportion for a hypothesis test. Now the pooled proportion is down here. It looks bad, but I'm just giving you lots of different ways that you could find the same thing. So p hat, p hat is the pooled proportion, which is really just, okay, if these two groups are the same, then it shouldn't matter if I throw them all into one big bucket or one pool. And then if you're a success, you're a success. And if you're in the total, you're in the total. Right, and so then what we're doing is we're just throwing them all into one big uh, pool. And so depending on what you have, the combined number of successes over the combined number of cases is the pooled proportion. In our case, we have X1 and X2, and so that's gonna be the easier way. If you only had N1 and P1 hat, N2 and P2 hat, you'd have to do a little bit of math, but not too bad. But we have X1 and X2. So p hat is x1 plus x2 over n1 plus n2, which means x1 is 454 plus x2 is 69. Maybe I'll do it on just a big one. 454 plus 69 over, I want to say 680 over plus 105. 
what's the main thing you want to check is that your pooled proportion, you're just pooling these guys. So it should be somewhere between those two proportions. Right? That's a nice way to check your work. 454 plus 69, p hat is 523. 680 plus 105, 785. So 523 divided by that, p hat is roughly 0.6662 to four decimal places. Point six 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 two is somewhere between these two guys, and so that checks out. Why did we need the pooled proportion before we can check the conditions? This is the proportion that I would expect if the two proportions are the same, right? Then I should be able to use this in place and it shouldn't matter. Okay, so the conditions. Now we're actually ready to check the conditions. This is for two sample proportion. Hypothesis test. Each of the samples have to be randomly sampled. So the first condition, and I like to break it up by independence and normality later, but you don't have to, so I'll do it in orange. The question that I quickly made up, uh, didn't state whether they were randomly selected, but uh, let's assume that they were, right? Where these are the conditions, or really what we're stating uh, are the assumptions, or the assumptions, if you prefer. We assume each sample was randomly selected. Maybe it said in the original uh, blurb, but I can't remember, so that's fine. There's also the N less than 10% condition. Uh, it's important that you mention each sample, right? This has to be true for each sample. And so the N less than 10% condition, well, 680, is less than 10% of all Americans. And I'm going to say that 105 is less than 10% of all Duke University students, I assume. And we assume 105 is less than 10% of all Duke students. These are the same conditions for independence as for one sample proportion. So now we're just lugging those over and applying it to both. The new one is the independent samples, right? We assume that the sample uh, from the GSS survey is independent of the sample of Duke University students. In general, we can say something like, we assume 
the two samples are independent of each other. Good. The normality condition depends on if you're doing a hypothesis test or a confidence interval, right? If you're doing a confidence interval, then you need at least 10 successes and failures uh, observed in each sample, right? So you have to check both samples, which is tedious, but it's not hard, right? And so for a hypothesis test, we need at least 10 expected successes in each sample. Now, how are we gonna find the expected successes? Now the expected successes is for the hypothesis test and the expected successes comes from the pooled proportion, right? If I'm expecting these things to be the same, then I should be able to summarize it with the pooled proportion, and so that's what makes it my expected success. So N1 times P hat is 680 times 0. 0.6662. 680 times 0. 0.6662, I get 453.016, which is greater than 10. Remember, these conditions will always check out. It's just, we have to know how to do it. Uh, and then, N1 times Q hat, or if you prefer 680 minus all the successes, Right, whichever, whichever way you prefer, just to match, I'll do one minus 0 0.662, which is 0.3338 times 680, 226.984, which is still greater than 10. That's for sample one. Now I have to do it for sample two, and two times p hat is 105 times 0.6662, which is 69.951, which is greater than or equal to 10. And two times q hat is 105 times 0.3338. Oh, messy. It's small, 35.049, but it's still larger than 10, so it all checks out. Notice that this is for sample one, and this is for sample two. You have to do it for both. I guess I did the successes and failures in each sample together, and 10 expected failures. I'm careful to not say at least 10 expected uh, successes and failures, because then the total would be 10. That's just me being uh, very picky. 10 expected su successes and 10 expected failures in each sample. There. Therefore, the conditions, usually what we say is the conditions for inference are satisfied, right? 
we can now use this sample to infer about the entire population or the two populations. The conditions for inference are satisfied. Now we're ready to do our hypothesis test. which we always follow these steps. Step one is to state your hypotheses. State your hypotheses. That's on your formula sheet. Right? Just need to know where to look. So if you're doing a hypothesis test, we're hypothesizing about P1 minus P2, the population proportions, the difference in population proportions. And so whether you prefer P1 is equal to P2 as your null hypothesis or that the difference between the two is zero, doesn't matter, uh, whichever one you want. One thing to remember, though, is I want to see question-specific subscripts in your null and alternative hypotheses. Otherwise, they don't mean anything. One and two, unless you link it to something in the beginning, doesn't mean anything. In your Z, you're allowed to just use one and two as long as you've established up above which one is group one and which one is group two. So, I usually use P, uh, let's do just US is equal to P Duke. All right, or GSS if you prefer, or the US. But I'm letting it represent all Americans or all US citizens. Uh, and then P Duke is the proportion of all Duke University students. Or if you prefer H not P US minus P Duke is equal to zero. Notice that those two are, are saying the same thing. I like this one because it, it gives me a direct comparison between the two. And so my alternative hypothesis, well, I wanted to know if there was a difference in these proportions. And so a difference, how I'm going to reflect that is in my alternative, I'm gonna have a not equal to. Right. P U S is not equal to P Duke. Or if you prefer P U S minus P Duke is not equal to zero, something else. gets trickier if we wanted to have an inequality here. How does that compare to zero? And so that's why I prefer just to have them lined up like this. But technically what we're hypothesizing about is the difference in the proportions. So this one makes more sense in theory, but kind of in an applied sense, this one is more useful to me at least. This is where I make a note to myself that this is a two-sided test. I don't care which direction the difference is going in, right? I just want to know, are they different from each other? So that's two tails, right? So this makes it a, a two-tailed test. Or I guess we've been calling it a two-sided, so I should call it that. Oh, nope. Two-sided test. We parking lot that information until step three, where we have to find the p-value, right? But that's when I need to know, okay, do I need a one-sided p-value or a two-sided p-value? And so that's why I like to just make a note up here that that's where it came from, right? Way, way ahead or long ago, I guess. Stating your hypotheses is usually two marks out of seven. Okay. And so from here on out, there's uh, seven marks.
typically. So I don't do the conditions because those will just be check boxes and you just need to know which ones and usually one mark or so. So the mean potatoes is going to be from your actual hypothesis test, which is why I was tempted to skip the conditions. Um, because this is where the where all the marks are. I do a whopping two marks for your null and alternative hypotheses. There's a lot of places where you could go wrong here, right? Maybe things like not using a colon here, but using an equal sign here is bad. Why? Because this is a, a statement. My null hypothesis is this, right? So you don't want to use an equal sign here. That's I'll take marks off for that. I'll take half a mark off for that. I want to see question specific subscripts, right? And so if I don't see that, I'll take half a mark off. And you have to have an equal sign, right? Has to be about the population proportions. And your alternative has to match in terms of what you're talking about. And then you have to get the sign correct in your alternative hypothesis. There's probably more than uh, two marks to be able to take away there, but I just, if you, if it's all wrong, you, minus two. Now, the reason I make it worth a lot, two out of seven is, is quite a bit of marks, right? But from here, this is how you communicate to me how you are going to proceed with the question. How are you supposed to know that you got it all wrong? and you use the one sample proportion, for example, for the rest of the question. So as long as you follow through from whatever kind of weird hypothesis you may be told me that you're going to test, then you can retain as many marks as possible. So that's why it's worth, it's a heavy hitter. And then, um, but it also sets up the entire question. Wow. Well, and how you're going to solve it. Everyone's going to get full marks. I know it. Because I just told you. Step two is, uh, I call it do the test. Usually. Technically, it's calculate the test statistic. But that's boring and kind of hard to say. Calculate the test statistic is really just calculate the Z that's next on your formula sheet. So if you go to your formula sheet, right here, a hypothesis test, I give you the null and the null hypothesis, which is really also giving you the alternative hypothesis because it'll just be whatever's from the question. And then I give you that Z is one of these two. This is just a matter of preference. I prefer the first version, right? P hat, Q hat has not been distributed over these fractions. That's the only difference between these two, right? And so for me, I ignore the second one because it's, it's a little bit more work in terms of keystrokes on your calculator. Nothing, nothing crazy, but I prefer this one. And so I'll bring that in. Maybe I'll bring in boy, uh, the whole thing to show you. Do the test. I don't do this one. Pick one. I've buttered my bread. I know which one I like. So for me, I like this one. Z, once I have a Z, I know how Z behaves, right? Z, it follows a normal distribution centered on zero with a standard deviation of one. I know how to find probabilities associated with Z from the table, and I know all these things. So that's nice. And so then my Z 
is going to be P1 hat minus P2 hat. As long as you keep the group one, group two separate, you don't have to use question specific subscripts anymore. I do wanna just highlight here since I said I would take marks off. Must use question specific subscripts in H naught and HA. There. Now it's in writing. I know there's still going to be someone you took marks off. And now I can say, well, I wrote it there. Okay, it's been a while since we calculated P1 hat and P2 hat. So I'm just gonna go grab those. also have the pooled proportion was 0.662. And we also have N1 is 680 and N2 is 105. So we have all these components and we're ready to do, and because I'm starting a new page here, P1 hat minus P2 hat, really what we're interested in is how far is that difference from a hypothesized difference of zero. But if I'm going away from zero, I'm subtracting zero and it doesn't really do anything for me. P hat Q hat times one over N1 plus one over N2. I'm trying to write big, but I'm not very good at it. 0.6676 minus 0.6571 divided by 0.6662 times 0.3338 times 1 over 680 plus 1 over 105. As long as you write out what you are about to enter into your calculator like this, you can skip writing down all the steps in between here because it's very tedious. And so as long as you're careful about your, your algebra, do one over 68 and then do one over 105, add those two together, then multiply by 0.3338, then multiply by 0.6662, then don't forget the square root. And that's where I'm going to check in. 0.6676 minus 0.6571. I'll do that first. 0 0.0105. And 1 over 680 plus 1 over 105 times 0.3338 times 0.6662, which is still really small. So I'm going to skip the square root because once I take the square root, it'll be a little bit bigger. 0 0.0104460436. So now 0, 0.0105 divided by that, I get a very small z, 0. 0.212352851111. Right away, your gut reaction here when you get a small z like that 
Well, first, let me check in. Did you guys get a small Z like that? Okay. That's a relief. When you get a small Z like that, what does that mean? It means that this difference that we saw is only 0.2 standard errors away from zero. That's not very far at all. So it's basically at zero. Remember the guideline is two standard errors away. Then we start to say, okay, maybe not, right? Then we start rejecting H naught. But here, all this work, because this is just math, step two, is just one mark. I take half a mark off for any kind of typo, silly calculator errors, right? And so not very much here, right? But as long as you show me what you're about to do and that looks good, and then you tell me what your Z is, even if your Z is wrong, I that's okay, you just take half a mark off. And as long as you continue using that wrong Z in the rest of your work, it's okay. Right. Okay, all that work for one mark, I know. Step three, find the p-value. To find the p-value for a Z, we use the table. And so I'll bring in the table. Paste. Okay. So I have a Z. Now, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna try to place my Z somewhere along this line, but they're increasing as we move to the right. And so it's really gonna fall somewhere here between zero and 0.674. Now this for the p-value is where I need to remember, okay, did I have a one-sided or a two-sided test? And so we had a two-sided test and where did we find that? Or how do we know? Because I have a not equal to here. Right, so that's the disconnect. They're really far apart, right? And so that's hard to remember for a lot of people. And I know I'm gonna get questions. How do I know? And it's because they're so disconnected. So what we write is you write your absolute value of Z that you found. 0.212, I'll round to four decimal places. I have three in the table. So as, as long as you have at least three, then you're fine. Two, one. And this Z from the table we found is somewhere between zero and 0.674. which on the next line means your two-sided p-value is going to be between two numbers. So you put your two-sided p-value in the center. Now here's the tricky part, right? Is, okay, when z is 0.674, the two-sided p-value is 0.5, right? But when Z is zero, the two-sided p-value, which is the area in both the tails, must be one, all right? And so it's somewhere between 0 0.50 and one. And I'll just show why that is while my iPad kind of glitches. It's not good. So I have zero and I found that my Z is somewhere at 0.2124, but the table 
is at 0.674. Now the table tells me that from here and here at negative 0.674, it's 0.25 and 0.25, right? We can see that from the table. The area in one of the tails is 0.25. The area in both tails is 0.5. So that's what it's doing. But then here at zero, the area in one of the tails is 0.5 and the area in the other tail is also 0.5. And that's how we get the two-sided p-value of 0.2124, which would also take into account negative 0.2124. Yeah, tiny. The area in both the tails is somewhere between 0.5 and 1. This is just to illustrate, this is all you need to, to write uh, for step three for one mark. There's kind of more than one mark that you could lose again. Uh, but I, I set it up that way because ultimately, as long as you follow through with the correct p-value or uh, with a p-value that you told me that you found, uh, then that's okay. That's, that's kind of the, the name of the game. So here, right, if you told me you wanted a one-sided p-value, that's wrong. Right. If it's between one and 0.5, that's wrong because that doesn't exist. Right. It's from smallest to largest. Uh, if you told me that Z is between two different numbers, that's wrong. Right. But in the end, I'm only going to subtract one mark overall and then I move on. Because as long as you follow through in your conclusion, Step four is your conclusion. We set a total of seven marks, two marks for your null and alternative hypothesis. So that leaves five. One mark for your Z, that leaves four. One mark for your P value, that leaves three marks for your conclusion. Why? Because your conclusion has three parts. one for each part. What are the parts? First, I have to compare my p-value to my alpha level. Is it less than the alpha level or not less than the alpha level? Then, what does that mean in terms of my null hypothesis? Do I have enough evidence to reject h naught, or do I not have enough evidence to reject h naught? And then, the one people love to forget, what does that mean in terms of the question? So we use a, a standard blurb and because it's not all gonna fit here on this page, I'll just bump it down. Since our two-sided p-value, now this is where I don't really care what you said here. In fact, if you are totally blanking on a question and you, you don't remember how to find your Z or how to find your P value, you have to remember that you need to do those things. But if you just said, okay, I, I totally forget how to calculate my Z, I can't do it. I am going to say that my two-sided P value is between, I don't know, 0.05 and 0.1. You don't get any marks because that's wrong, but you can still get these three marks because as long as you follow through with the wrong p-value, right? As long as you told me, hey, I, I totally forget. Here's what I'm going to use. And as long as you follow through with that correctly, I don't care. I know what you're thinking. Couldn't you just memorize just a standard hypothesis test? 
you could, it's not really going to work, but you could in theory. Um, but just so you know, so, so it's not about the math necessarily. There is math involved. But if you're totally blanking, just tell me, hey, uh, this is what I'm going to use. And then just follow through with that. Okay. Okay. Since our two-sided p-value, now it's your chance to show off all the things that you remember to keep track of, right? You remembered it's a two-sided p-value, not a one-sided p-value. Uh, is between is between 0.5 and one. What else do you have to remember? You have to remember to compare it to the alpha level. Now the default alpha level is 0.05. So since our two-sided p-value is between 0.5 and one, it is not less than our assumed alpha level. of 0.05, right? It either is less than the alpha level or is, is not less than the alpha level. And just using that standard structure is going to help you in the next part, which is, which means we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught, right? You either have enough evidence or you do not have enough evidence to reject H naught because we did all our testing assuming the null hypothesis was true, right? And so now we don't have evidence against it. It's a perfectly reasonable result. And so, which means we do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. Finally, what does that mean in terms of the question, right? And this is where I don't want to see the word accept, right? We never accept a hypothesis. There's still a, a probability that we're wrong, right? And so type one, type two errors come into play, but let's ignore those for now. But just recognize that there's always a chance that we're wrong. And so that's why we never accept a hypothesis. You either have enough evidence or you do not have enough evidence to reject H naught. Therefore, what was the question? Is there a difference between the two? You reword the question as an answer, but it's so far away that I'm just gonna try to remember what it was. Uh, therefore, there is not a significant difference in the proportion of Americans versus Duke students who would be bothered a great deal. I'll add by the melting ice caps or something like that. Comparing your p-value to your alpha level is part one. Compare, or what does that mean in terms of your null hypothesis is part two. And as always, most importantly, your conclusion in terms of the question is arguably the most important part, part three. I'm not gonna underline all those.
now I'm all paranoid. Turns out the, the clock in my morning classroom was broken. So, but I didn't realize it until the very end. I didn't realize it was the end either. Um, so now I have to check, but this one's right. Okay. We could do a, a confidence interval and I think you can try it on your own, uh, but I want to introduce a new type of question today. And so here we have, oh, construct a 95% confidence interval for, fine, I'll just use the slide that's conveniently there. Uh, construct a 95% confidence interval for the difference between the proportion of Duke students and Americans who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the northern ice cap. Now they've done P Duke minus P US, which means that they, they reverse these. The only thing that would change really is our sign here would change. So we're around a positive number instead of a negative number but it actually isn't going to change anything at all. Okay. And so what we found was, okay, if we did uh, Duke minus all Americans, then we found that this interval is between negative 0.108 and 0.086. I do wanna add the interpretation here. We are, we built a 95% confidence interval. So we're 95% confident because remember confidence intervals, or I guess I haven't maybe uh, been explicit about it. I feel like I've said it though, but confidence intervals are usually four marks. The math is two marks and the interpretation is two marks. Half the work is just the interpretation, right? But we use the standard kind of canned um, sentence. So we're 95% confident the interval from negative 0.108 to 0.086, and we talked about last day how zero is a difference of zero is in the interval, and that matches our conclusion from the hypothesis test, right? Where we said, okay, these are not significantly different, meaning zero, a difference of zero is, is a plausible difference. And so, uh, captures. the difference between the proportions and let's see here. Between, oops, between, between the, and then here I'm gonna cheat and just between the proportions of Duke students and Americans who would be bothered a great deal by the melting of the Northern ice cap. So once you've got that first chunk, then you can just take the question and reword it as the answer. Okay. This is for the difference between the proportions. And we talked about, okay, it depends on how I found the difference, right? Duke minus Americans, versus the Americans versus uh, minus a Duke is going to yield different values. They'll just be flipped in their signs. But this here is two marks. Nice. And then this is what I gave you to try on your own, but we just did it in a lengthy way together. Do, 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 do. with 
that, we're ready for the next section, but also our next type of question. So here, this is the type of question. Now, GOF stands for goodness of fit, which sounds weird, but it's uh, the technical term for what we're about to do. So even though it, it sounds wonky, but it's a goodness of fit test and goodness of fit tests are pretty common in stats. And so uh, I don't really react to it anymore, but I, I understand that it's kind of uh, funny sounding. Yeah. This is going to be our first new distribution. Yeah. So here, This will be our first new, I'll say continuous distribution, because we've talked about the binomial distribution and you did that bonus assignment on the Poisson distribution and those are all distributions, but those are discrete distributions, right? Distributions, we use them to find probabilities. And so this will be our first new continuous distribution. Right, so far we've only seen the normal distribution for Z. So here versus Z, which follows a normal distribution centered on zero with a standard deviation of one. We're very familiar with Z at this point. Right? So now we've got this chi-squared distribution. Just to give you an idea of uh, what we're going to be doing here, the chi-squared, the chi-squared shape changes depending on, uh, can I say a parameter being very general? Okay. So the shape of now, chi is a Greek letter that looks like a, a fancy capital X. Okay, so this is the chi squared. So this is chi. You don't want to say chi because then everyone knows you don't know what you're talking about. So you want to say chi. Or chi. Yeah. So it's, it's chi-squared. So the shape of chi-squared depends on a parameter. Called the degrees of freedom. Now, in general, chi-squared, just a, a typical chi-squared looks like this. Just a, a general chi-squared distribution. Oops. Maybe I should make it even more skewed. Like that. What's really nice, sort of, I guess, is we will only do hypothesis testing for a chi-squared goodness of fit test because we can't do a confidence interval. Remember, a confidence interval took an estimate and went out an equal amount. But there is no there is no good center here. And so building a confidence interval isn't going to work. And so for us, for a chi-squared, 
we only do hypothesis testing for chi squared. That's good news. Less things to be able to do. And one of the things to keep in mind, and I am kind of jumping the gun here, but the p-value is just always going to be the area in the tail. We're still gonna have a p-value, and so all those things stay the same, but the p-value is just the area in the tail. Okay. And we're gonna have a table that tells us how to find the p-value, just like we did for, t for z. And so nothing's really changed, except we've got this wonky shape. So as kind of an example, or I guess before that, what do we mean by goodness of fit? If I have more than two groups, right? So if I have the GSS and Duke University students, but also Okanagan College students survey responses, now I have more than two groups. What if I wanna compare them all simultaneously, right? So now, I've gone from one proportion and then we did two proportions and now I have three or more proportions. We're gonna be able to compare three plus proportions. And so here, so many arrows uh, comparing three or more proportions. As an example, maybe we have the GSS survey results, the Duke survey results, and maybe the OC survey results. Right? Now I have three proportions, or maybe we wanna add it, maybe do, we could have four groups, right? Survey proportions. P1 hat, P2 hat, P3 hat, P4 hat. Could just stop at three, but the goodness of fit test is going to be able to take into account as many groups as we need, three or more. So the goodness of fit comes from, okay, I have some hypothesized distribution of these groups, right? For example, right, we could compare all of these to um, 0.6 or something like that, 0.65, right? Are they all different from 0.65, that kind of thing. And so the goodness of fit comes from how does our observed distribution compare to our hypothesized distribution? As a kind of a, a fun example, <laughs> um, Walter Frank Raphael Weldon was an evolutionary biologist and the founder of biometry. Now, anything that ends in metry is statistics. So econometrics, biometrics, uh, all those things are just the statistics of economics, of biology, all that kind of things. And so, and he founded a, a journal, blah, 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 blah. In 1894, I guess he was super bored and he rolled 12 dice 26,306 times. And he recorded the numbers of fives or sixes, which he considered to be a success. Now, obviously, he had a hypothesis that, okay, I think that fives and sixes are occurring at a different rate than the other values, right? Hopefully, he was kind of thinking that and didn't just roll 12 dice 26,000 times for fun. But he did observe that fives and sixes occurred more often than expected. And Pearson, who is another stati famous statistician, uh, hypothesized that this is probably 
because of how they made the dice. Okay, so if you have an inexpensive dice, then they just cut out the pips. And so if you think about it as a fact in dice, both the sides, the opposite sides add to seven. And so the face with six pips has the opposite side as one. And so then you've cut out more from the six pip side than the one side. And so then it's lighter on the one side. Sorry, I did those opposite, it doesn't matter. Uh, lighter on the one side and heavier in the bottom, right? The one pip side is heavier. And so that's why the six uh, is lighter. So that's why if you're, if you're playing dice, you wanna see if there's a hollow or if the hollow has been filled, right? Because then it won't be a fair die. So that's an experiment that he did. And then uh, in 2009, uh, Zachariah Labby at U of Chicago repeated this with a machine and so obviously more kind of uh, advanced and so there was about 150 so ba, 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 ba. how many times did he do it he repeated the experiment blah 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 because he was using a machine He was able to record how many of each one, two, three, four, five, six he saw, right? Which is kind of uh, more advanced, right? Than fives and sixes being a success. And so now we have the uh, individual number of pips on each roll. Okay. And the overall probability, we have a line here at 0.16666666, which is what? One over six, right? And so here, I'll just add the overall probability of each die face should be one over six, right? If they're evenly distributed. Right? And so what we saw, and these bounds, when you see bounds like this, these are confidence intervals. Okay. That's kind of nice uh, to know what those are. And so now, if I'm expecting one sixth, then I'm expecting each of these counts to be around the one sixth. Now we're not seeing that here, so let's see. So Labby rolled 12 dice 26,306 times. Now, if each side is equally likely to come up, how many ones, twos, all through six would he expect to have observed? So if each one is equally likely, there's six different outcomes, then we should have 12 dice 26,306 times divided by six. Right, spreading all those outcomes out evenly. If outcomes are evenly distributed. which turns out to be 52,612. So now we have an expected count and we've seen that, or we've heard that terminology before, right? This is the expected count in each category. Which we can summarize like this. So we've got the outcome of each roll. Right? We've got the observed count. So this is the observed count. And this is the expected count. Expected count, if it's an even distribution, is the same for all of these, right? And so here, expecting 
an even distribution. What we observed, 53,000 to 222 versus what we expected, 52,612, what we're going to do is take into account all of those differences and see if they're overall behaving basically as we expected, or are they behaving very differently from how we expect them to uh, to behave, behave, behave. So the chi-squared goodness of fit test asks us, okay, how well or how good does the observed distribution fit our expected distribution? So the goodness of fit test, um, or I'll say chi-squared goodness of fit tests, how well our expected distribution fits our observed distribution. And we've already talked about why are those expected counts the same? But then, of course, the observed counts are all different. That's OK. We can even kind of uh, trust our gut here. We saw the graph already, and we saw that the observed for ones and the observed for sixes are higher than the others. But I would say these are all in the 52,000s. So kind of reasonable. But what we want to know is, are those ones and sixes kind of throwing things off enough to be considered different overall? Now, on your formula sheet, we only have this. Uh, your null hypothesis, right? Because all we are able to do if we've decided we have a chi-squared goodness of fit test, your null hypothesis, which means we're only doing a hypothesis test, is that the observed distribution equals the expected distribution. Same as before, I want to have a question specific statement. I don't want to see the general statement because that's just from your formula sheet. I want you to kind of translate it to um, this one's kind of tricky because there's not much to say, but do these data provide convincing evidence of an inconsistency between the observed and the expected counts? So in that case, our null hypothesis is that there's no inconsistency between the observed and the expected counts. We have to assume that they're the same until we have proof otherwise, just as the other hypothesis tests, which we're going to say, OK, the observed counts follow the same distribution as the expected counts. And maybe I would add in something about die faces or something like that, but it's OK. Not too picky. Whereas the alternative, now a chi-squared is always going to be a two-sided test because we don't have that other side of the distribution. So it's always a two-sided test. And so the flip side is there is an inconsistency between the observed and the expected counts, meaning the observed counts do not follow the same distribution as the expected counts. So here I'll make a note. Notice chi squared um, HA is always two sided. 
but we already saw that the p-value is just the area in the one tail and so we don't really worry too much about it it's more in terms of how do i phrase my my alternative hypothesis and it's going to be okay then it does not follow the expected distribution and maybe i shouldn't say call it two-sided because you guys are too good about that how about not equal to that's the same but sort of different in this case All right do not follow the same distribution Okay. So what we're going to do and what the chi-squared test statistic does is we find out, we quantify how different the observed counts are from the expected counts. A go-to move would be to subtract the expected from the observed. That's what we are going to do. But then large deviations um, provide strong evidence for the alternative hypothesis. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of step it up a notch. And here, chi-squared, this is our test statistic chi-squared test statistic. It's going to be your observed minus your expected for each line. That's why I have a little subscript I here. So for each line, you're going to have an observed minus the expected. Then you're going to square that, then divide it by the expected, and then add those all up. And so I think it's on one of these slides. So I want to save myself a little bit of writing. But here we do this calculation for each line and then add them up. Do this for each line. then add them up. DF stands for the degrees of freedom. And at the very beginning of this section, I said, okay, well, the shape of the chi-squared is actually going to depend on a parameter called the degrees of freedom. And here it is. It's on your formula sheet. Now, we just need to know what k is. And I'm going to tell you, but we're also going to look at it. k is the number of categories or groups being compared. So it's going to be the number of proportions that you want to compare to each other or counts. But taking it back a little bit, any test statistic looks like this, a point estimate minus the null value divided by the standard error of the point estimate that will stay the same. Any test statistic looks like that, okay? So that means we need to know what the point estimate is, what the null value is, and then how do I find the standard error of that point estimate? And so we figure out what the difference is between these two. We take into account the spread, the standard error, and now we can find what the chi-squared looks like. We can break it down, but for now, I think we're just okay with taking it at face value from your formula sheet, right? And so I have my observed 
how far is it from my expectation or my hypothesized distribution? And then what do I do? I square those differences because otherwise if I add up those differences, they'll add to zero and it's not gonna get me anywhere. But I also wanna amplify large differences by squaring them. And then my spread kind of translates to the expected count in this case, which is kind of far-fetched for us, but that's okay. So the sum is really from I equals one to K where K is the total number of cells. Okay. So here, our job is to find the expected count, right? Which is usually kind of the, the math that we need to do. But then what we do is we take the observed minus the expected, right? Observed minus the expected, we square it, we divide by the expected, and we find that that value for outcome number one, so a, a one die, I guess, rolling a one, is 7.07. .07. Now the chi squared is going to be the sum of all these. So then this chi squared is the sum of all those squared deviations divided by the expected counts. We don't know the behavior of chi squared and we don't really need to it does not behave like a Z. And so 24.73, it could be small, it could be little, it depends on the degrees of freedom. We can talk about why is it squared, but it's the same as for the standard deviations, why we square things, right? And so it makes things negatives positive, so we can add them up and they actually add to something. And Differences that already looked unusual, so large differences will become much larger when we square them. We've seen this before in the standard deviation calculation. It's the same, same idea. So we need this uh, degrees of freedom. Now, this is, this must be old. I guess I shouldn't delete all of them, but uh, so far we've seen one other continuous distribution, which is the normal distribution, and we have not seen the T or the F distribution yet. We're actually gonna skip the F distribution so, but we will be working a lot with the T distribution. So the chi-squared distribution just needs the degrees of freedom and that determines the shape, right? Whereas the normal distribution is unimodal and symmetric with two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation determine what that thing looks like. So here, three different degrees of freedom and what they look like. So the solid line has two degrees of freedom, which is really the same as when I have K is equal to three because the degrees of freedom is K minus one. It's minus, right? I don't know why I'm second guessing, but I am. Yeah. I know this stuff. I promise. So if the degrees of freedom is two, then K must be three, which means I have three groups that I'm comparing. If the degrees of freedom is four, then K must be five. And if the degrees of freedom is nine, I must have 10 different things that I'm comparing at the same time. That's a lot. What happens is when I have three groups that I'm comparing, this is this 
solid line is what the distribution looks like. Right. And so we don't need to draw the distribution, but it is good to keep in mind how it changes. And so here the green line or kind of the dashed line, I guess, is when I have five groups and then at 10 groups, it starts to look more and more normal. I don't like these, which of these is false? As the degrees of freedom increases, the center of the chi-squared distribution increases as well. Now for skewed distributions, for the center is at the kind of at the peak. And so, yeah, the peak seems to be moving outwards as I increase my degrees of freedom. So that's true. The variability of the chi-squared distribution increases as well. That's also true. This two degrees of freedom is nice and tight, right? Whereas four degrees of freedom, okay, we've got a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more relaxed. And then nine, it's really relaxed. And so this is true as well, meaning the last one has to be false, but let's talk about why. The shape of the chi-square distribution becomes more skewed, less like a normal as the degrees of freedom increases. That's not true. The opposite is true. The opposite is true, right? As the degrees of freedom increases, the shape of the chi-squared di distribution becomes more like a normal distribution. And eventually it would approach the normal distribution. But that's for a third or fourth course in stats, not for us. So the p-value, now let me just grab this here. So the p-value is going to be the area in the tail, which could be here or here. The p-value is always the area in just the one of the tails. We can use technology, right? You can use Excel and you can find the p-value for a chi-squared distribution, probably chi dot dist or something like that, uh, if I had to guess. But for us, we're gonna use a chi-squared probability table in class, right? And what I've done is to save another printout is I've put, um, we will use the excerpt. How do you spell excerpt? Excerpt? I don't know. On the formula sheet, it's just a mini version of a bigger table. Now, if you have the um, the textbook downloaded, because it's free, so it's not bad. Um, they have a bigger version of this table. But for us, down here, now notice that I'm jumping from the chi-square goodness of fit testing. Next week, we're going to talk about the chi-square test of independence which also uses the chi-squared. So then once you have the chi-squared calculated, then you can use the same table again. And then I have the chi-squared table of critical values, which looks like this. The breakdown looks like this. So, I've condensed it to just a couple of upper tail areas, which are the p-values. Right? And then the degrees of freedom, one, two, three, four, five, 
notice that, okay, if the area in that tail is 0.1, then depending on the degrees of freedom, then it's going to move out further and further, right? Because we know that squished, squished behavior, right? So let's say, uh, well, I didn't do a very good job drawing it methodically, but I can. If I let, this tail area be 0.1, then at two degrees of freedom, which is the solid line, that's at 4.61. So let's put it here somewhere. 4.61, which means your p-value is going to be here. Uh -huh. Four point six one. I've forced a tail area of point one. Point one. I made it small. What about for four degrees of freedom? With a tail area of point one, and maybe I don't need to draw that. Tail area of point one, that's going to happen at a chi squared of 7.78. Now I'm looking at this green line now, 7.78. Let's say that happens here. Well, the table gives us all we need. We don't actually need to draw the chi squared as long as we understand how it works. Now notice that your degrees of freedom isn't going to change in the question, right? In the question, you only have a set number of categories. And so your K is fixed. So your degrees of freedom is fixed, which means that what you can do is if you have two degrees of freedom, for example, this behaves the same way that that Z star line does on our uh, on our other table, right? It's increasing as I move out. And as my chi squared is increasing, what's happening to my tail area? It's decreasing, right? I'm moving further out into the tail and I'm decreasing the area in the tail. And so this is your P value for the upper tail area. So there's two ways that we could deal with a chi-squared, I could say, okay, if I want to force my alpha level to be 0.05, that's common, that's the default still, and I have two degrees of freedom, what I would need is I would need my chi-squared to be bigger than 5.99. And so we can use the critical value approach, uh, where is it? Okay. Um, we can use, we can actually use the critical value approach for Zs as well, right? I could force the tail area to be 0.05 if that's my alpha level. And then I can figure out what Z I would need to surpass in order to make that happen. And so, uh, but it's more common for chi-squareds. And so for chi-squareds, we can use uh, either the p-value approach or the critical value approach in step three of our hypothesis test. So what are those two things? The p-value approach 
is exactly like it has been. Right. We place we place our calculated chi squared, right? Our test statistic. We place our calculated chi squared. Um, on the table and find a range for the p-value. And here I'm formally introducing the critical value approach because now I'm for chi-squareds, I'm expecting you to be able to use both. Whereas for Zeds, I'm I'm only expecting you to be able to use the p-value approach. Although if you prefer the critical value approach, you're allowed to use it. But the critical value approach says that use the table, we use the table. At k at degrees of freedom equal to k minus one, and force the tail area to be the alpha level. And force the tail area to be the alpha level. Right, I'm forcing that area in the tail to be 0.05, for example. Then I find the corresponding chi squared. Then find the corresponding chi squared. This would be your chi squared critical value. This chi squared is the critical value. What we do, we know how to use a p-value, right? If it's less than the alpha level, then you have enough evidence to reject H naught. That's still true. But for the critical value approach, if chi squared calculated is larger than your chi squared critical, we have enough evidence to reject H naught. We have enough evidence to reject H naught. And vice versa. What does that look like? It's because in a generic chi squared distribution like this, Let's say that this is at, let me see here. Let me draw it more beautifully. Let the degrees of freedom be four. That means I have five groups. Cool. In this kind of generic situation. Then from this table, I'm also going to let alpha be 0.05. That's my default alpha level. Right. Once I've passed that point, then I can reject H naught. So now what I'm going to do, so I'm going to force alpha to be 0.05. And then I'm going to map it back to what that chi squared would be at four degrees of freedom. So what this is saying is that, and chi squared always starts at zero and then it keeps going. But what it's saying is that when chi squared critical or when the chi squared is 9.49, .9, 
I forced this tail area to be 0.05. By that logic, right, if my calculated chi squared is bigger than this point, right, I'm increasing as I move out on the x axis, that's still true. And so then if my calculated chi squared is larger than 9.49, then I can reject H naught because the tail area is less than 0.05, right? So I think the, the chi or the critical value approach for chi squareds especially is a lot easier than the p-value approach, but we'll practice both. And so for example, if your chi squared calculated is somewhere out here, then this p-value is less than 0.05 just because of how areas work, right? Further out into the tail, I have less tail area. Oh boy. For a little bit of practice, I want you to try these here. Now this is a bigger version of the table, right? And they've kind of shown you seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 degrees of freedom. I've decided on the test, five degrees of freedom is enough. That's six groups. That's a lot still, right? And so you can use this bigger version of the table, but it behaves the same way, right? I've just done little extracts. And so if we want to find chi squared 30, so the chi squared calculated is 30, and I have 10 degrees of freedom. Holy, 10 degrees of freedom. I'm gonna to try to place 30 somewhere along here, but a chi squared of 30 is out here, which means what? I know how this behaves. At 29.59, the tail area is 0 0.001. So at 30, it must just be less than 0 0.0001 or just two zeros. I'm going to go for that one. There's another one that you can try and we'll pick up here. I'll make a note to myself here. Pick up here on Tuesday. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, enjoy your weekend and I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>